Hello everyone and welcome to The Library, your weekly queer roundtable that covers everything from pop culture to politics, where we'll be inviting our friends to read or be read. The Library is presented by Them, a community platform that is designed for and by the LGBTQ community. And I am Philip Picardi, your host. And I'm your co-host, Meredith Toulouse. We're so lucky to be joined today by our dear, dear friends, the first of which is Darnell Moore, who's a celebrated activist and soon to be debut author whose new book, No Ashes in the Fire, comes out in May. Welcome, Darnell. Glad to be here. Thanks for joining us. And our second guest is the amazing Erin Lang, who is one half of the leadership of the grassroots organization Get Equal and is a host of First Person on PBS. Thank you so much for being here, Erin. Of course. Thank you for having me. Yes, PBS. Okay, so today we are diving Education. right uh, into yeah. a heavier a heavier topic. Meredith, why don't you why don't you set up the piece that we that we're covering today? Yeah, this week uh, we published a piece by uh, the trans journalist Caitlin Burns on the conditions facing trans women in prisons, and specifically a case that involves uh, Jane Doe versus Massachusetts Department of Correction, in which a trans woman who has been living as a woman and has never lived as a man for 40 years is, is being housed in a men's prison in what she claims are terrible conditions of harassment and violence. And I know, Erin, you know, like this has been a long time sort of area of advocacy for you. What was your initial reaction? I think it's really important to note that prison isn't enjoyable for anyone. Mm -hmm. um, and the conditions that lead trans women to prison are often dire and because we're trying to survive. So it's hard for me to mobilize around things like safer prisons for trans people because I would rather prisons not exist altogether. Right. What are solutions that we can think about in order to not place trans women in positions like this because, you know, because they are disproportionately incarcerated mm -hmm. um, in this country, unfortunately. Is uh, this woman in a men's prison, just to clarify? This woman, yes. Yeah. Um, and, and she is in her 50s and she transitioned 40 years ago. And oh. so she has actually never lived as a man, as an adult. So her whole life she's been living as a and woman. And socialized as a woman. And, and is now placed in a prison with a bunch of men. Yes, exactly. I was kind of shocked when I was reading there was a study done by the National Center for Trans Equality and the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force that showed that 21% of all trans women mm -hmm. have been incarcerated at some point in their lives compared to a just 5% incarceration rate among the general population. And then that statistic jumps to be an astonishing 47% for black trans women. So I guess, you know, reading this piece and not being familiar with a lot of, you know, prison legislation and prison reform, mm -hmm. I guess I was shocked at how pervasive this problem was for the trans community. Um, and, 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 I, and I was confused at why trans women were being placed in men's prisons if they are identifying as women in the first place. Like, what are the institutional things that are there that are kind of making this problem worse? Well, one of the arguments in the piece is that, you know, is that a lot of prison systems consider trans women, you know, hazardous to a uh, cis female, um, a cis woman prison population. So rather than, quote unquote, expose them to cis women, they would rather house them in men's prisons. And then one of the sources in the article, Leslie Webster, um, who has been incarcerated, pointed out that she was actually placed in solitary confinement mm -hmm. as gonna, a solution. I was going to yeah. say, though, that the prisons are sort of a consequence of a, of a range of different issues, though, right? So before mm -hmm. um, black trans women or black queer and trans folk, period, mm -hmm. are in prisons, they are impacted by a variety of different structures. Right. So it is the case also that LGBT young people here, particularly LGBT people of color, in New York City are over-policed. Mm -hmm. um, they are, and, and by over police I mean they are most likely to be stopped on the streets. Um, if you are gender non-conforming, trans young folk are likely not only to be stopped, but arrested at three times the rate of, of others. So far before, and, and, and if you're black or brown, then, you, so the, the, the you, you, you know, the- It's just sort of magnified. It's gonna be magnified. So I guess part of the issue is, for me, um, it isn't that we are facing a problem with the over-policing and over-criminalization of trans women of color and LGBT young people. It's also that a lot of our sort of mainstream organizing, our rainbow flag LGBT organizing, 
doesn't attend to these issues. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. right, so we think about LGBT liberation almost always concerned with sort of legislative uh, and rights around marriage equality, but this is the issues, one of the many issues facing pe young people, yeah. particularly in New York City and around the country. Right. Yeah. When the Black Lives Matter movement was gaining steam, Trans Lives Matter also started emerging, and then you would see signs during protests that were saying Black Trans Lives Matter or Black Queer Lives Matter mm -hmm. in a way to uh, kind of make a point to include queer and trans people in, in this movement. And obviously, you know, Darnell, you've been closely kind of writing about the movement and, and very much a part of, of the movement. How are some of these elements a part of the new documentary that you're working on? Because your yeah. documentary is about queer people who are living in Atlanta or, or the larger in South Atlanta, as well? In Atlanta, in Atlanta. Yeah. So it's called Got Something to Say, um, Black LGBT Life in ATL, A History of Black LG LGBT Life in ATL. Where does the name come from? So, Andre 3000, back oh, in the I day, there was this whole beef within sort of the hip hop community, this idea that hip hop is owned by the Northeast. And um, Andre 3000 was pretty much saying, no, but we are here too. We got, the South is here and we got something to say. Um, and I was using that as a reference point to say that typically when we think about LGBT life, it's typically cast as the Northeast, New York City and up or Chicago and, and San Francisco, rarely do we think about the South mm -hmm. geographically, and rarely do we imagine black people living in the South as being on the forefront of the, of the progressive lines, pushing for LGBT freedom. And it was my way of giving voice to folk in Atlanta specifically, what we call now the black LGBT Mecca um, of the U.S. And, and interestingly enough, the, the doc starts with Dee Dee Chambly, who was a trans woman who grew up in Atlanta, um, in the 70s and 80s, grew up on the streets, um, has grown to be one of the foremost activists in Atlanta, but uh, in Georgia and across the country, working and in, in, in relates to um, doing HIV AIDS activism. She was uh, given an award by President Obama and, and pushed against, she was fighting to get sex work uh, deregulated and, and legalized. I mean, all types of work she's been doing, but we don't know her name. Mm -hmm. We should, and it was important for me to start with someone like Dee Dee um, as a representation of the type of work and, and people's uh, lives, the type of lived experiences that have been in the South all this time. Speaking of, of rewriting history, we do have a column on them.us called Them Story where we kind of tell the profiles or the stories of queer people throughout history who have been overlooked or forgotten, and this week, Meredith, it's about Bayard Rustin. Yes, um, this week we are um, we want to discuss Bayard Rustin because it is Black History Month. Bayard Rustin is is someone who lived out and understood what democratic principles, as it's understood in America, really means. So Bayard Rustin was born in the early 1900s, grew up mostly and committed himself to the Communist Party um, until the Communist Party turned away its sort of focus from civil rights and and focused solely on the war and he became part of the Socialist Party. Um, he was also a pacifist who believed in nonviolent resistance, was very much committed to the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi, and was one of the people who influences King's nonviolent resistance. And, and let me be clear here that when we're talking about Bayat Rustin, um, in the same way that we will say that Martin Luther King did not do anything alone, Bayat Rustin didn't either. There were women, mm -hmm. um, black women, there were folk who were the sort of non-churched or non-respectable looking Negroes who were doing work um, behind the scenes and in front of the scenes. I mean, and there are so many, right, that we need to acknowledge, and, and not just by Rustin because of his uh, outright public acknowledgement that he was, at the time, he used the word homosexual and gay, but Pauli Murray, for example, was a gender non-conforming lawyer who coins the term Jane Crow to correspond and challenge folk to think that, yes, racism exists, but so does sexism outside of the construct of white supremacy and within the movement. Byron Rustin got arrested for, uh, you know, he started, was one of the people that started the Freedom Rides and was arrested during one of those Freedom Rides. He was also arrested in Pasadena, California for having sex, with having, being caught having sex with a man. 
um, when wow. sodomy laws were still happening. So we think here is a, is a person who influences King, who is a chief architect. A law, can we just pause that? Let's give rest in, right. let's give rest in his, rest in his due. He's living right. on the wild side. Listen. Look, and also, lo yes. long also before I love your very subtle correction of my pronunciation. <laughs> yes. So amazing. No, but, um, you know, what's important, though, is by at Rustin along with A. Philip Randolph were actually, um, they were on the cover of Life magazine, mm -hmm. touted as the architects, the leaders of the March on Washington. That, we don't know, Rustin's name, right. um, says something about the way that we are so committed to an idea of a leader as being mostly mm -hmm. cisgender, mostly heterosexual. Um, you know, there was pushback by the government and also within the ranks of the movement that was discouraging Martin Luther King from befriending him. People mm -hmm. was, they were threatening him, saying, if you keep hanging with this dude, we're gonna tell everybody y'all gay. Mm -hmm. And um, Martin bent, you know, right. and fell to pressure. So we celebrate Byatt Rustin because Byatt Rustin was doing the yeah, thing, yeah, you know? Right. Um, when the thing, when the thing, when that, that being that radical queer person that he was was, you, it's criminalized now, yeah. But I mean, he went to jail mm -hmm. um, for being himself. And he has so much, she's offered so much to, to the movement in terms of, um, not only in terms of sort of the movement building, but a lot of the idea and theory around it is much old to him as well. And it's incredible that, you know, they, they had this friendship. And, and I guess it's, it's not hard to understand why it was difficult for Martin Luther King to not want to kind of ally himself with Bayard Rustin at that time, given all of the other obstacles that were in his way. Um, but obviously, to your point, it's incredibly important that we honor and acknowledge you know, his contributions to society today, too. OK, and now for my favorite part of the show, which is aptly titled The Go Off, where uh -oh. we have 60 seconds for one person on this round table to go off about something that is really bothering them today, and of course, our inaugural go-off will be hosted by none other than Mix Meredith Toulousin. Thank you. Who will be I'm talking, very passionate about this issue. And you'll be talking about Adam Rapon's edges, which I actually just learned <laughs> is not about his hair. So we're going right. to... Timey. We're, okay. All right. <sighs> okay, All right. Google, set a timer for 60 seconds. Okay, one minute, starting now. My go-off this week is about Adam Rippon getting ripped off at the Winter Games in 2018 at the free skate in the winter competition because of the fact that he was too femme. The fact of the matter is that he skated a clean performance and his artistry was clearly better than his Russian or Canadian teammates, and yet he was not scored properly. And the only reason this could be the case, and I have the data to prove it because I have his component scores, is because of the fact that he's too feminine. The fact of the matter is that his edge work is impeccable, his artistry is phenomenal, and he deserved to be first in that competition. That is my go-off for the week. No femphobia, femboys are us. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that was beautiful. Yeah. I am literally speechless. I don't think I'm crying a little. <laughs> I'm crying a little. You're I'm crying passionate. for you. I'm crying on the outside. Okay, Google, stop. <laughs> That was really incredible. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that extremely impassioned and extremely <laughs> important go off, which now leads us to Reader Receipts, which is kind of our version of queer fan mail, where we actually broadcast reader criticisms of a them piece that aired this week. And this week, actually, we're talking about Carrie Dragshaw on Watch What Happens Live. And I, and I said Carrie Dragshaw, not Bradshaw, but we're getting there. So Carrie Dragshaw is a quite a famous social media personality who basically has made an Instagram account out of impersonating Carrie Bradshaw kind of in drag. And it's, it's like loosely a parody, but also a tribute. And it's a really funny thing. So Andy Cohen had his friend, Sarah Jessica Parker, who famously played Carrie Bradshaw on Sex and the City, onto his show and surprised... For the Gen Z kids out there. For the kids. Who have not seen... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, oh my gosh, wow. I can't imagine. Um, Sarah Jessica Parker guest, uh, was a guest on Andy Cohen's show, Watch What Happens Live, and Andy surprised her with some drag queens who, who basically impersonate um, Sarah Jessica Parker in various roles, and obviously one of them was Carrie Dragshaw. And in this very kind of... Uh, 
sweet moment, um, Sarah Jessica Parker was trying to call out Dan and say, you know, how much her his Instagram had kind of touched her and how prolific he is in, in this way. But when she was trying to identify Dan's mm -hmm. pronouns, she said he or she or shim, which caused many of our readers to write in to say that they several. were several several of our readers to yeah. say that they were very upset that we um, posted a story about um, about Dan's kind of spot on the show without calling attention to that detail. And I guess, well, let's open this up to discussion. What do we think about Sarah Jessica's use of the word shim? I think it's classic for starters. Um, shim is a word. No, listen, the first time I heard shim was on a Bernie Mac comedy special. So it took me all the way back. Bernie just Mac. Here. Bernie Mac, <laughs> right, rest in peace. But um, it was a classic. Um, but another thing I want to say is I think people have to understand that drag queens are not trans women. Trans women can be drag queens, um, but the two are not, you know, one and the mm -hmm. same. I think for me sometimes I struggle because I think we've all been taught to kind of refer to drag queens as like she and her, but I'm always telling my friends like these are men. Like we have to, uh, we have to affirm that these are actually men. So I see it as a tongue tie, an awful tongue tie for who she's talking to with Andy Cohen and whoever would have been watching that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I. It humored me. I think that's the unpopular opinion of the group. So. Yeah. No. And, and to be perfectly honest, you know, like I think as an editor, I definitely felt bad that that was not something that we called attention to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like Dan, uh, you know, Dan wrote this, you know, like super effusive, like really wonderful personal essay, and um, and we and. You know, like from my standpoint, I was just like, oh, well, that is enough. And mm -hmm. to be perfectly honest, I actually didn't watch the segment prior to Ooh. prior to publishing the piece, which in retrospect I should have done because what I would have done was asked him to address that specific issue, mm -hmm. you know, and to say, okay, like, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about the fact that trans women have often been insulted using this word. Um, well, and Dan actually did just that, just for, for you guys. Mm -hmm. He just released a statement to us that said, and I quote, I think she was trying, she being Sarah Jessica Parker, trying to find the right pronoun and meant absolutely no offense. It was, after all, said in the context of a kind, loving, and compassionate compliment. She was remarkably kind throughout the entire night on stage, off stage, backstage, when the cameras were rolling and when they were off, discussing her admiration and affection for the work and writing that I do as Carrie Dragshaw, and what uh, a moment that was. So, anyways, Absolutely. that Absolutely. is that. Well, thank you so much, Darnell and Aaron, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you to our lovely Meredith, the lovely co-host. And please let us know what you think of the show. Like, subscribe on YouTube, follow us on Instagram, Twitter. We are at them. Find us, tweet at us, read us. We will maybe feature your reader receipt next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.